What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back. Oh, I saw you, Mike. I saw you try to sneak in there. Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Nick isn't here, which means I was left with the duties of introing this week's episode. Mike was about to cut me off, but I got a little bit too loud for him. His headphones weren't plugged in all the way, so he didn't hear me starting. Uh, honestly, I think we're just going to do what we always do. We run through the games. We're going to talk a little shit, talk about how Justin Jefferson is probably the best wide receiver I've ever seen how Chase Claypool made both of us look like we're blind and many other things like Derrick Henry just being an absolute animal and burying me week after week. Um, <laughs> Mike, you look a little tanner. How was your weekend? I heard you uh, climbed Mount Everest or something like that. Dude, it's crazy, man. I went to Tahoe with the girl and uh, we went up this place called Mount Talek in South Lake Tahoe. It's about 3000 feet elevation, literally just a six mile trek uphill. That was, it was like, you're like climbing rocks, climbing the side of things like, I mean, I real after that, like my my ass hurt, my legs hurt, my fucking feet hurt, everything hurt. Um, realized that I'm way less fit than my girlfriend is. So I need to step it up, but uh, it was hella fun, man. And the views were dope. Like I sent you guys that video um, on on our group chat, but yeah, it was it was awesome, man. We went up there and we made a couple of uh, pastrami sandwiches, homemade, avocado, a little a little mustard, um, fucking bomb, homemade bread. Yeah, went up there, crushed those, and then uh, hiked back down. Man. It was a good time. Yeah, that video was very picturesque. It was like a movie, but the only movie we care about is what comes out on Wednesdays on Nick's channel and our channel. So let's hit the intro and get right into it. All right, so, I mean, we'll do our regular things. Uh, honestly, man, it feels kind of fucking nostalgic. We haven't done a Noah and Me show in, like, a long time. And I think we'll probably be more frequent going forward because Nick's too busy box-breaking fucking plastic cards these days to actually do real football analysis. Uh, so it'll be more of us going forward. But hopefully, hopefully, we still get the Godfather on from time to time because, you know, we'd love to kick it with all three of us. But let's kick it off with the games. I'm going to start with the most recent one, and it's the Chiefs versus the bills and the one thing i want to take away from this game is I, I i've already seen it people on twitter were quick to jump on josh allen for underperforming this game and i'm not going to do it because i've said all offseason the chiefs pass defense is really really underrated and, and i think they're really good and look josh allen made some bad throws and you know it's something that you that you kind of have to expect with Josh Allen right like he's he's not the most accurate quarterback he still isn't he has Stephon Diggs to help him they've built the offense around him i think he's still going to be a fantasy stud going forward but you just can't expect him to put up like gaudy numbers against top end pass defenses which is exactly what the Kansas City Chiefs are so i am actually raining a lot there too like yeah, i know he's not like the most accurate guy as is when it's raining on top of it <laughs> i'm sure that doesn't help uh, and on top of that like when you're playing against Patrick Mahomes and you see what yeah. he does any quarterback's kind of going to look like shit. And we saw what happened uh, Monday night a few weeks ago. Lamar Jackson went up against the same defense, and he put up a dud too. Exactly. I'm not moving him down my rankings because he had a bad game in primetime. And for fantasy, it wasn't even that bad of a game. Like, he didn't look great, but he's still putting up, like, what, 17, 18 yeah. fantasy points? And the receivers weren't helping him. Like, Stephon Diggs was dropping passes. Gabriel Davis dropped a couple passes. Like, John Brown stopped running because the knee was broke. So, like, it, was, it wasn't all on Josh Allen. And when, and when it mattered, like, he actually, like, that, that last touchdown they scored, like, he went on a pretty nice drive and kind of put them back in position. So, look, I don't think anyone's selling on Josh Allen. But if you are, if you are in a league with those people that are, like, lock, take lock haters on Josh Allen, um, which we are not because, you know, I did hit on Josh Allen. But, you know, after seeing what he's done, I, I kind of have to praise him and give him, give him the necessary praise that he's earned. But if you are in a league with someone that just like is waiting on that sell opportunity for Josh Allen, I would actually take take that and just jump on it because I think he's actually probably here to stay. Like the organization believes in him, and he's he's improved drastically. I think there's no way around that. Um, on the on the flip side of it, Clyde Brazilaire still cannot score a fucking touchdown because of these goddamn refs. Uh, they they called holding on the offensive line. Personally, I thought it was bullshit because basically he, the guy just took him and just like planted him to the ground i don't think it was holding uh but who, who what do i know i'm not a fucking offensive line expert but i think you know what, what do you think about this like i mean obviously levy on bell signed right with kansas city chiefs i don't think bell is washed uh, i think he's actually still pretty good plus my good luck chuck corollary with adam gase where basically after he fucks you um and you move on you f go on to find much greener pastures i think that's true for levy on bell as well we saw what david williams did coming to the kansas city chiefs as well and look i mean I'm not out on ACH. I don't know about you, Noah. Like, I think 
I think I'm going to stick with him, especially in Dynasty. Um, you know, there was he was already he was only taking like 60% of the snaps anyways. So like you you need someone to like back up back him up, right? You cannot go as a Super Bowl contender with Darrell fucking Williams and Darwin Thompson Hurdler as your only backup running backs. And I think you know Bell got dropped. He was available for cheap, and it just made sense. Right. Yeah. I think that's they all did it last year though. They did have uh, Darwin Thompson with his gold grill and Daryl Hen- or <laughs> Daryl Williams bring yeah. them to the promised land. I do think that Le'Veon Bell is probably gonna have a bigger role than like what Leonard Fournette has in Tampa Bay. Like we all thought Leonard Fournette was washed. We saw him, he had like one big game against Carolina. <laughs> he's definitely washed, he's just healthy scratch week after week. He's basically Jordan Howard. I do think uh, as you were saying, Le'Veon Bell is much better than what a guy like Leonard Fournette is at this point. And they were talking about it. They're like, Yeah, Eric Bienemy said to Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Uh, you don't worry about what you can't control. Just go out there and play, which is coach speak for, I'm going to take you out of the game a whole hell of a <laughs> lot and you're not going to be able to do anything about it. Uh, but what he showed the other, or last night or two nights ago, whenever the hell we put this out, um, what do you have, like 25, 26 carries, averaging like seven and a half a pop? It's no yeah. question that he's a very, very good running back. And as Mike said, he's been very unlucky when it comes to touchdowns. And I don't think that's his fault, whether it be penalties or the offensive line just folding every single time he's running up the middle. Like you can go on Twitter type in CEH goal line or something like that. And there's probably going to be one of a million film grinders that shows how the offensive line didn't pull the right way or whatever. They didn't block the right way. He really hasn't been helped all too much on the line. Uh, I do know that like coaches think that because you're smaller, you can't handle goal line work. So Le'Veon Bell is going to probably eat a few like pound cakes and come in at 225. He's going to be the goal line back because of that. Um, But I do think that it's definitely going to hurt his upside because I don't see how Le'Veon Bell doesn't take over the goal line role, even if it's not of, Clyde Edwards Hilaire's fault uh, to this point for what's happened to him. Uh, and as, as on the receiving side of things too, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is a great uh, running back to catch passes out of the backfield, but slow, so is Le'Veon Bell. And it's not like this is an offense that wants to throw to the running back a ton. Patrick Mahomes would much rather throw it 70 yards down the field than two yards out to Clyde Edwards Hilaire or Le'Veon Bell. So uh, it's definitely going to cap his upside a little bit. I still think he's going to be like a 15, 16 touch a week guy. Uh, when it boils down to it, when you're on the Chiefs and you're getting that many touches, I mean, we've seen it already. He hasn't scored touchdowns, and he's still producing as a back-end RB1, high-end RB2. So uh, although the touches are going to go down, I still think the production is going to be like 80% of what it is. So if somebody is selling low in your league because Le'Veon Bell is now in town, I try to pick him up. If you can trade – I'll propose this to you, Mike. Who would you rather have, Clyde Edwards-Alaire or DeAndre Swift? Ooh, uh, that's a tough one, but I think I'm going to go with Clyde Edwards-Alaire still. That's where I'm at. Because you think about it, it's still going to be a, a split in Detroit. And Detroit is nowhere near as good yeah. as the Chiefs. And the other thing is, and I guess we can talk about Swift after this just because of the game he had. But, I mean, he played the Jacksonville Jaguars. Anybody who plays the Jacksonville Jaguars is going to do what he did. I mean, even Adrian Peterson had a good game. Uh, we think back a few weeks, Joe Mixon basically tried to convince us that he was still a starting caliber NFL running back against the Jacksonville Jaguars front. Uh, I just think that not that I don't believe in Swift's talent because I think he was my RB2 pre-draft and then his landing spot kind of made me shy away from him a little bit and the landing spots of others made me move them up a little bit. Uh, but I just think that the split there, the fact that Adrian Peterson was still playing on more a higher percent of the snaps than Swift despite his breakout game leaves me a little bit wary and I'd probably just rather have Clyde edwards Hilaire in a better offense in a very similar situation at this point. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think so too. Um I would say, uh, what what else do we have to talk about in there? I mean, Mahomes, Mahomes has been like he's been I, right. you know, he's, he hasn't been like lighting it up. Um, so, you know, in your classic one quarterback leagues, he obviously isn't paying off if you took him where you took him, which is why you never take quarterbacks early. But in Superflex, he's still a stud. I'm not worried. He's still making making plays here and there. Um, I think that's all I want to cover in that game. Oh, and Devin Singletary still stinks. Um, hey, you can't always. say he stinks without talking about Zach Moss. No, yeah, yeah, Zach Moss. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Zach Moss. I mean, I was told he broke a lot of tackles. He's, you know, he's, he's a really good receiver and he's going to take over touchdown stuff. I mean, on the bright side, he got more touches than Cam Akers and we'll get to that later. That was fucking sad business, but yeah, Devin Singletary, I've been telling people to sell him the entire time. And I think you should still sell him. You wait for that, wait for that big game because the chiefs run D stinks. Um, and he did not do, he didn't do much. He didn't do much. So like 20, that's why. Three yards on like 11 carries or yeah. something like that. I mean, he's the second best running back on his own team. Zach Moss, the third best. Josh Allen's obviously the RB1. Hey, TJ Yeldon. Come on now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the only thing that, you know, Singletary had all this opportunity while Zach Moss is out. And uh, yeah, and TJ Yeldon is, is relevant again. So that tells you all you need to know about that backfield. But let's move on to the next game Arizona versus Dallas. Jesus Christ. Uh, 
that O line. I mean, I was worried about the O line even if they had Dak because we've seen Dak without Tyron Smith, but at least Dak is Dak. Dak will produce and he's got weapons, right? But put Andy Dalton behind a bad O line and Look, it was not good. It was not good. Buda Baker I still... looked like prime Troy Palomalu out there. Like, every single yeah. time they snap the ball, you know he's <laughs> having some sort of impact out there. Seriously, he looked, he looked incredible. Um, but, like, I, I still think there's greener days ahead, though, for Andy Dalton. Uh, he still is a productive quarterback with weapons. And Amari Cooper is great. He's still a top-end wide receiver. CeeDee Lamb still put up seven catches for 64 yards, just continuing his historic fucking rookie season. I'm telling you right now, like, you cannot acquire this man off my teams for, for anything short of a miracle because I'm just not trading him um, in any leagues that I have him. He's been incredible. And, look, people are going to, you know, people are going to stunt on him because they say he's, like, running out of the slot, which he is. But, look, I don't care. Uh, if you're getting me – I don't care how you're getting me points as long as you're getting me points. And as long as he's on the field and producing, he's building that confidence, eventually he's going to be able to progress and, and become that wide, out wide receiver because he's done it in, in college as well. And – Michael, it's bad for Michael Gallup, right? And Michael Gallup had to. No, Michael Gallup cool. is bad for Michael Gallup. He had a <laughs> wide open touchdown. He dropped it. Like he runs routes that don't really help you in fantasy unless you're Julio Jones and unless yeah. your quarterback is anybody but Andy Dalton. Uh, people think that he's like the alpha just because he threw to, Dalton threw to him like three times at the end of the Giants game and he threw to him in the end zone in the red zone here. He just happened to be open that one time, and we've seen it. We've seen it like play out over a full sixty minutes, right, against the Arizona Cardinals. Ceedee Lamb is ahead of him. Mark Cooper's ahead of him. Ezekiel Elliott fumbled twice. He's still ahead of him in the target totem pole. It's like there aren't very – I don't know. There's not much upside there. You can say he's a boom-bust play, but it's mostly just bust-bust because he's not going to be able to connect on most of those deep balls that Andy Dalton is trying to throw to him. Yeah, he's basically a best ball play. If, if, you, if you trade for him in Dynasty, it's the hope that he kind of lands somewhere else um, eventually down the line. But, yeah, speaking of Zeke, I mean, two fumbles – He's had 20 fumbles since uh, 2016. So this is not news, but just this year it's been brutal. I think he has four fumbles on the year. Uh, does that mean that he's going to get benched for Tony Pollard? Obviously not because they paid him a ridiculous contract and Jerry Jones wants to run the triplets, even though one of the triplets is dead for now. Um, but yeah, I mean, eight targets. Eight targets for 31 yards. I mean, there's some straight-up Jordan Howard shit uh, going on right here in terms of the That's a full season of Jordan Howard. <laughs> yeah, full season of Jordan Howard on 11 targets. So you know Dal- Dalton is dumping off, and part of it is because, like we said, that line, they lost uh, Tyron Smith, but they also lost Zach Martin, uh, Hope, who's like the highest-paid guard in the league. I think he's coming back, though. I think it's yeah. probably a concussion or something. Yeah, it was a concussion. So, so hopefully he'll be back, so that'll be good. But look, I would not panic yet on Dallas. Like, I still think there's going to be a very productive asset. CeeDee Lamb is still a locked-in starter every week. Mark Cooper is still a locked-in starter every week. And Ezekiel Elliott is going to be a locked-in starter every, every week. And they're not going to face a, a tougher, like, pass rush on the Cardinals. I know the Cardinals lost uh, Chandler Jones, who's their best pass rusher, but they still, they still got enough blitzing going on there. So, But if the Dallas Cowboys, I mean, their schedule, like, I think from a passing perspective, like, maybe – it's okay because, look, they got Washington, Eagles, Steelers is bad, Vikings is really good, Washington, and then Baltimore, and then Bengals and, and, and 49ers. So they face, like, basically the Eagles twice, right, and they face the Washington Redskins twice. So the matchups aren't, aren't that bad. So I think brighter days are ahead for this offense, so don't bail on them yet. Yeah, uh, there's still the going to be volume for a guy like Zeke, even in those matchups against, like, Baltimore and against uh, Pittsburgh, as you said. Like, they're tough matchups. But if you're seeing 11 targets, you're seeing 15 to 20 carries, like, he's going to see more volume on the ground than what he did this past week just because, like, sure, they may be playing from behind, but he's also probably not going to fumble twice and seed a few a few series to a guy like Tony Pollard. He's still going to be a 25 touchback a week. And even if it's on a bad offense now because the offensive line stinks and they have Andy Dalton behind center, I mean, James Robinson's like a top 10 running back in a worse situation than what Ezekiel Elliott's about to be in. So uh, don't sell him low. Don't sell him for a guy like Kenyon fucking Drake, who had like a 70-yard touchdown at the last second of the game. If you can sell Kenyon Drake right now, and you can get a guy like Ezekiel Elliott, good on you. If you can get anything for Kenyon Drake right now, I'd do it because he did look good this game, but it was the Dallas defense, and Ernest Johnson fooled us into thinking he was Nick Chubb 2.0 against him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on the flip side, Kyler Murray continues to fucking impress. I mean, I made a trade where I actually gave up Dak plus Noah Fant uh, in a half PPR for, for Kyler Murray, so I'm super happy about that. And no, I'm starting him. I have him, Lamar, and the GOAT, Justin Herbert, in the Superflex League, so he kind of stepped in for me. But yeah, he's incredible. I mean, he when he runs, 
like the reason why I really like Kyler Murray is because he reminds me, like, I've mentioned this before, but he reminds me a lot of Russell Wilson when he runs. He, he has great awareness of what's coming. Like he's never taking hits. Like he's always sliding like five yards before anyone's even near him, uh, unless he's running for the touchdown, obviously. So he's going to provide that rushing, the rushing upside. But from an arm talent perspective, I mean, there's nothing that he does that I don't think anyone else like in the NFL can't do. And obviously he has some anticipation stuff that needs to work on, but like in terms of just pure ball placement, arm talent, like him, Russ, Mahomes, like they're all in the, like a tier of their own. And it looks better too. Cause he's so small. Like it's like a little rocket coming out. It just goes 80 yeah. yards down the field. That catch by Christian Kirk too. I know it was a great oh, throw. Yeah. But he caught it on the ends of the ball, like yeah. super hands. That looked great. I know you were happy to see him break out. Uh, and that connection yeah. between D hop and Kyler Murray looked a little off yesterday. I mean, don't worry about it. He still had, what, like 10 targets, and he ended up with 70-something yards because he had that huge catch uh, catch and run at the end of the game. So there's really nothing to worry about here. And I know Kyler Murray did have those few deep throws, and between those, like, he didn't have much else. But I don't know. He has struggled a little bit with his arm this year, but I think that offense is just too good, and he's too good of a player uh, to continue struggling like that. And he does make up for it with big gains. And we've seen in the past DeAndre Hopkins be a target hog and come down with, like, eight to 10 catches a week. So I'm not worried at all about anybody on this side of the field, except for the running back situation. As I said before, if you can sell Kenyon Drake, sell him. And uh, Chase Edmonds just seems to be like the satellite back. He wasn't getting any goal line work. Um, Kyler Murray did take away a goal line carry from Kenyon Drake on a little read option that he scored, but Drake also got a goal line carry. And obviously that breakaway run at the end sealed the deal. Yep. Um, that breakaway one now is actually like super painful because I was facing him in the league. And then I was, I had him in a league and I was like, literally I was, I was up by five points and down by six points in one. So like, yeah, I just like simultaneously canceled out. That's part of the, that's why I don't check scores uh, during the week because like I'm in too many leagues and like there's just too many permutations of shit for me to win all of them. And it's not possible. But yeah, the interesting thing I guess in the game is like, you know, it's concerning. Like people are like, well, Christian Kirk, like he, he broke out, but he only got like those two catches. But like, I mean, Kyler Murray only had nine completions in this game. So uh, I mean, they dominated from beginning to end, and they just fed Kenyon Drake, right? And, and Kenyon Drake at this point is basically a, a poor man's like 2018 Derrick Henry because he's getting no targets. Uh, you need touchdowns or big plays to kind of break, and that that ice the game touchdown. Um, you can't expect that shit to happen every week. So he he is like, I mean, one of the greatest disappointments, I guess, from my perspective uh, <laughs> this year. Yeah, he's basically um, Todd Gurley with two knees, but looks like he has <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, which is also bad for Chase Edmonds, who deserves more touches, but isn't going to get it because they're just going to feed him. Um, I think, you know, Denver versus New England, not much to go over there other than the fact that we got upset by fucking Drew Locke yeah, at home. That was <laughs> pathetic. Um, Cam Newton looked awful, but, you know, from a fantasy perspective, he still rushed for like 75 yards. Um, so he's always going to give you that floor. So if you have Cam Newton, keep riding him. I think he's going to be fine. If you have Denver uh, – I mean, Jared Judy's getting outplayed by fucking Tim Patrick. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, you know, early on we said Sutton's a wide receiver one, Sutton went down, and then Tim Patrick's like, no worries, I'll take it from here. Drew Locke looked pretty good, to be honest. Like, he made some nice throws to to Tim Patrick. Fantasy perspective, though, like, you still probably don't want anything to do with this backfield. Cam Newton, it's kind of, this is like kind of like a poor man's Bills, uh, Buffalo Bills, where Cam Newton's the RB1, and then you're going to have, like, a, a carousel of, of scrubs behind him. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything on this game. I don't really have my, too many takeaways. Yeah, it was like only James White and I guess Philip Lindsay had a decent game, like 23 carries for 100 yards or whatever it was. I'm not sure what the verdict on Melvin Gordon is, if he's going to get suspended or not. But then yeah. again, like Denver's offense isn't going to be in many situations where they're going to score. We know yeah. Philip Lindsay isn't going to be the one catching a ton of passes out of the backfield. You're really just banking on a big rush, a uh, big long touchdown out of him, which I guess is it's cool. But as you were saying, this game is like very, very uninteresting. Anytime you win with like six field goals, like what was it, 18 to 12, there isn't really much to talk about. I did start Brandon McManus in one league and he got me like a 25 burger. So I was smiling through to the bank with that. But <laughs> uh, other than that, yeah, this game, it kind of kind of sucked. I yeah. think it speaks for itself. But let's move on to the best game of the slate this week. A lot of action. Houston versus Tennessee. Our boy Ryan Tannehill probably the biggest hit so far of this offseason. Actually, no, not the biggest hit, but one of the biggest hits. He is balling out of control. You got his boy, AJ Brown back. Derrick Henry fucking dunked on Noah's head again, 212 yards. Hey, I didn't tell people touchdown. to fit him this year. <laughs> um, but the, the other story here is like, look, in the second game without Bob, Deshaun Watson, 300 something yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions. Um, Will Fuller locked in wide receiver one, uh, as long as he's healthy. And that's the key. Look, we don't know if he'll last a full season. I pray that he does. 
because I love watching Will Fuller play. But it turns out, look, Watson didn't need nuke. He need, what he needed was Bob to get the fuck out of town so he could unleash uh, on, on, this, on this offense. You know, he revived Brandon Cooks' career, uh, who's obviously one hit away from, from getting, getting, out, getting hit out. But A.J. Brown is back, which is you just love to see it. So now you have that tier of like A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf, C.D. Lamb, uh, and Justin Jefferson. I call them the untouchables because they're not going to be traded from most rosters uh, going forward. But, yeah, I mean, look, this is a fantasy goldmine. And, you know, people still don't like Ryan Tannehill, man. I've moved Tannehill into my top ten dynasty quarterbacks i, I gotta um, move him up too yeah I mean, he's uh, so good in this offense like i know they lost taylor lawan and people are gonna be nervous they lost his left tackle and i'm not sure this is like me not knowing anything about football but that offense just seems like everything is predicated on short throws they will take a deep shot every once in a while but it's just aj brown over the middle run after the mm-hmm. catch johnny smith over the middle run after the catch when Corey davis comes back same thing derrick henry we saw in overtime him catch like a 60 yard screen i just think that although the left tackle is a very very important position i'm not downplaying it at all I think that this offense is just way too good, and their their play style is just built on short passes and doing shit after the catch. And Ryan Tannehill gets the ball out quick. He's highly accurate, and he's just very, very efficient. We saw at the end of the game, they just ran down the field. With like eight seconds left, they throw a fade to A.J. Brown. Of course he's going to come down with it because he's a fucking animal. He's another guy that I was fading this year. Turns out if you're good at catching touchdowns one year, you're probably going to do it again. You're probably going to make me look like an idiot. So, yeah, he's definitely, in terms of dynasty, I got to move him up. I don't think I updated him at all, but he's got to move somewhere into my top five. Um, And just overall, this team, I don't care if they're playing Pittsburgh this week. They're just way too good. They're too good to fade in any matchup. People are ranking Ryan Tannehill outside, like, their top 15 quarterbacks on the week because of playing Pittsburgh. Sure, Pittsburgh killed Baker Mayfield, but Baker Mayfield is Baker Mayfield. He's not Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill cannot be stopped. Um, Maybe the addition or, like, the loss of the left tackle makes him run a little bit more, and we know he can do that as well. So, um, I'm just I'm completely confident in every single Tennessee Titans main option. And on the other side of things, I think Brandon Cooks is really sliding his way into like a low end wide receiver two type of role mm-hmm. because it's a very consolidated target share between Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks at this point. Um, and I couldn't leave this game without talking about how David Johnson still stinks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, they they kind of blew him out early. And look, I do think losing Taylor Lewan is is a big deal. And it's it's gonna hurt Henry, right? Because Henry is the type of guy that needs that full head. You might put him at left tackle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it's not gonna hurt him to the point where I'm like I'm saying bench Henry or bench Tannehill, but I think it will have an impact. And Tannehill has been operating at a historic efficiency. I think last year he was at like 7.5 percent TD rate. He's at still at like seven percent plus. So you're gonna expect some regression there, but you're not gonna bench him uh, against Pittsburgh, right? Like he's kind of one of those guys where you're just gonna play him. And look, he might have a down game here and there, but so does Patrick Mahomes and so does Russell Wilson. But for dynasty purposes, you know, I kind of tweeted this earlier on, but. He's like an arbitrage Russell Wilson, right? He's not as good as Russell Wilson. I'm not saying that. So don't, don't take that away and don't fucking try and snip that little clip and put, put it on Twitter and blast me. So I'm saying, but for dynasty purposes, Russell Wilson is only four months older than Ryan Tannehill. So you should not be concerned with age when it comes to Ryan Tannehill. They, they're both locked into long-term contracts through 2023. And this is a team that's built around them. It's built around Henry. It's built around Hit Tannehill. It's built around AJ Brown and John Smith. So in dynasty, like you should be furiously acquiring him and maybe he costs a little bit more now, but I think he's still worth it. He's one of those guys where I'm totally fine buying high on, especially if I'm a contender. Um, and, and look like Ryan Tannehill is going to ball out. So he's going to be a great guy to have, especially build around Superflex. Sean Watson moved right back up, right into my top three, top five dynasty QBs. Um, he's, he's just going to be a stud. I think the one concern, though, is if they start fire sailing uh, Will Fuller and like some of these other pieces on the offense and just leave Deshaun Watson by himself, it, it's not going to be good. And it seems like that, that is a possibility. So that's something to look out for. Um, next yeah, game. I think with B.O.B. gone, they're not going to try to make any like brash decisions with Deshaun Watson <laughs> playing the way he is. They're like, maybe we should just like hang on to our weapons. Maybe yeah. that'll help our quarterback a little bit. Yeah. Next game, speaking of stinking, Baker Mayfield uh, goes up against the Pittsburgh Steelers who have had, I think, like at least three sacks or like an interception like for every single game. Like that defense is super fucking legit. Um, you know, we're not going to bench studs against them. But like, yeah, if I had Baker Mayfield in any field in any kind of like league, I would have benched him. I don't have him anymore, luckily. But uh, he, he stinks. Um, I mean, he, he kind of looked like he was coming back a little bit. But if you look at like the way that he's playing – he does not anticipate. He does not lead his receivers. He's not really lifting anyone on that team. So you kind of hate to see it. But if anything, I would say this is a good buy low opportunity on Cream Hunt because if you look at the Cleveland Browns schedule going forward, it is yeah, it is Cincinnati, juicy. the Raiders, Houston, Philly, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Baltimore, Giants, and the Jets. Other than Philly, 
and maybe Baltimore, like that's top five running back type of matchups. I know it's more than five teams, but you can just like yeah. argue that they're top five matchups for a guy like Kareem Hunt. Yep. Bengals run funnel, Vegas weak. You know, Houston Texans run funnel. Eagles, their team stinks, so you probably get a touchdown. Jaguars, same thing, run a funnel. Tennessee, you can run on them in two. So it's gonna be it's gonna be wheels up. And at some point in there, Chubb's gonna come back. So it's gonna be wheels up for Chubb as well. But uh yeah, Baker Mayfield stinks. I mean, Chase Claypool. I'm going to take the L on him because he has yeah, looked no, I do too. I just he think we can chalk it up to Notre Dame being like kind of dumb. I mean, how are you running four fours at 240 pounds and you're like a slot receiver just running little curl routes and shit like that? The fact yeah. that he had as big of a game as he had two weeks ago, had a rushing touchdown, and then last week he almost had like three touchdowns. He was down at the one. They love this guy so much that they wanted to get him the touchdown so badly that they gave him another rushing opportunity. And guess what he did? He scored again. This guy is an animal, and in turn – I am very nervous with Juju. Maybe I'm overreacting because the guy's still young. We've seen his upside. But I moved him down to my dynasty rankings, and I didn't want to see his ranking. I just did the overall, and then I looked at my wide receivers. He's wide receiver 39 for me. I don't Holy shit. I have no confidence in this guy. He has seen more than six targets in just six of 17 games since the start of last year and over 84 yards once in that span. He just seems to be the wide receiver too, no matter who's on the field. And we haven't really seen a fully broken out Chase Claypool and Deontay Johnson play with Juju at the same time. If he operates as the clear cut three, which I have no doubts is going to be the, the case just because of how bad he's looked and how legit these other two guys are. And the fact that I think he's like a free agent after this year and he can be gone. I don't know. Maybe somewhere else is where he needs to be to be able to get more volume. I, he's obviously talented, but I know Nick said it like in passing last week, like, oh, he's too busy being a celebrity. But I think at this point, it's not that I want to like shit on the kid, but I think it's becoming a real issue because he's just not out there producing at all. Yeah, it's de definitely worrisome. And as a Juju stand, like it definitely hurts to see. I will say I'm not going to write him off because he is somehow only 23. Like, I mean, Cooper's only 26 and he's played six seasons in the NFL. Like some of these guys are just really, really young. I, I do think like for redraft purposes, you cannot start him anymore because when Deontay comes back, he's, he is literally the option number three. And Claypool has played himself into like that top dog role um, across from Deontay Johnson. But look, you hate to see it, but look, you also love to see you guys <laughs> succeed, man. I mean, like I was completely wrong on Chase Claypool and I'm uh, happily taking that L. And, but the, the good thing is like, I think you can still acquire him at, at pretty reasonable prices, right? It's not going to cost you as much as Lamb or as much as Justin Jefferson because people never had him that high. So like, you know, there's still going to be people, people out there that are like stuck in their old ways and, and like not willing to take the L on Claypool uh, and not recognize that he's actually a pretty fucking good football player. So there's a buy opportunity there. I'm going to probably try and explore and see what I can do on that front. Uh, maybe give it a, give it a week or two uh, to kind of like stem down from that fucking four, four TD game. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, Look, it's worrisome for Juju, for sure. Uh, on the Brown side, on the wide receivers, like, I don't even want to talk about the wide receivers because there's just, like, nothing to talk about. I mean. Yeah, Odell had that one game where he scored, like, two trick play touchdowns. We're like, he's back. Yeah. 2014 yeah. Odell. And now it's like, oh, he's still on the Browns. And this team still stinks. And they still yeah. don't want to throw the ball. So he's not somebody I'm too high on for redraft or even dynasty at this point. Yeah, you don't you don't want any piece of this passing game. You don't want Baker. You don't want anybody. Like it's time to fucking maybe put in Case Keenum to be honest. Just sling it and see what happens. <laughs> um, all right, next game, another interesting one. You know, supposed to be a blowout, but it actually ended up being pretty close. I mean, Carson Wentz was scoring like basically zero points for the first three quarters, and then put up like put up 20, 20 30 points in the fourth quarter. Uh, Lamar Jackson back to his old ways. Under 186 yards through the air, one touchdown, and nine carries for 108 uh, yards on the ground, plus a touchdown. So basically, what you draft him for. Uh, I think the big takeaway here is Mark Ingram has a high ankle sprain injury. So wheels up for the god, Gus Bus. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. It's, I think it's going to be some opportunity for J.K. Dobbins, who's been incredibly efficient on low volume. So hopefully, 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 this is the this is the kickstart we needed to get J.K. Dobbins in there because I, I, you know, I was very high on him off. Uh, coming into the season, and I don't know it was as well. So let, let's see what happens there on the Eagles side. I actually think, Mike, for a redraft, uh, J.K. Dobbins is probably somebody I'm going to try to sell high on just because this backfield. I mean, we even saw last year Mark Ingram was great, but uh, Lamar Jackson still takes a lot of those goal line carries. He still takes a huge percent of those rushing opportunities. He's still going to get fed. Gus Edwards, even after Mark Ingram got hurt last week, outsnapped and had the same amount or more touches as J.K. Dobbins. He seems to be the 1A to – J.K. Dobbins is 1B, and J.K. Dobbins is very talented, and he can easily turn like 10 to 12 touches into 80 yards and a touchdown or two. But I just think that if you can sell high on a guy like him and maybe buy low 
on another running back. Like, obviously, Zeke isn't going to be an option. But, like, a guy like DeAndre Swift, I feel like I'd rather have DeAndre Swift, even though it's a worse offense, just because I feel like there's so many mouths to feed in Baltimore. And they're basically just, like, a better version of the Rams where you never know who to start. And whoever you do start is going to stink for you that week. Yeah. Definitely. I, I can see that part of it. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with my boys, see what happens to see if he gets some more opportunities because like 15 touches a game, uh, what he, what he can do with it. Cause I, I think he is really good. And, and that offense is still pretty stubby and their schedule is actually pretty, pretty simple as well going forward. But on the flip side, we got Carson Wentz and the Eagles, Miles Sanders fucking injury. You hate to see it. You just, you just hate to see it. I mean, he's, he struggled with staying healthy, and if he had stayed healthy this game, I mean, it looked like he was going to go for fucking 6,000 points. I mean, time carries 118 yards, uh, and he was getting the targets. Um, obviously, Carson Wentz throws half of them into the dirt all the time, uh, but, you know, you, you hate to see it. You hate to see it. But Travis Fulgham, this is, a, this is a guy I want to talk about, and I acquired him off a lot of waivers. I think I got him in our BBB league for us, um, if I'm not mistaken. But he's had – back-to-back-to-back games of producing now. It's clear that he is the top target there. Zach Ertz, uh, he stinks. I mean, we don't want to say victory laps because he got hurt, but he stinks even before he got hurt, so I'm comfortable saying that. Um, he was never good. He's not going to be good. Dallas Goddard is the one that owned there. If he had Zach Ertz in Dynasty, you should have punted him when we told you to like three or four weeks ago because you're not going to be able to sell him because Dallas Goddard's coming back. Travis Fulgham is in the offense. When Jalen Rager comes back, I think that's the most interesting. If Travis Fulgham is doing this, no shot to Travis Fulgham. I'm sure he's a good player. He's proved that he's been able to do stuff. But if he can do this in his offense, just imagine what Jalen Rager is going to do for years to come. And it's going to be a beautiful thing. And he's, I think he's probably set to come back maybe within the next couple of weeks or so. So if you're in redraft leagues, you know, be sneaky. Grab him, put him on your IR spot to hold him until he comes back. Yeah, I think both him and Goddard are eligible this week, but they play tomorrow on Thursday, so I doubt they're going to come yeah. back this quick of a turnaround. Maybe the week after they play Dallas and then they get a bye. Maybe they want to hold him through the bye. But in yep. a divisional game, if they're ready to go, I wouldn't see any reason for them to hold them out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I totally agree. You should definitely get sneaky and, and try and do some stuff with that. Boston Scott, what do you think? Are you going to blow your fab on him and grab him? Uh, or, or what are you going to do with him? I wrote up the waiver wire article and I said, yes, blow your fab on him. Just because at this point, like, it's too hard to pass up on a guy who's probably going to see 15 to 20 touches. And even if it's just for two games, you play the Giants and you play the Dallas Cowboys, if you need a win, you can't afford to pass up on that. I know he didn't look good early in the season, but guess what? Neither did anybody on this offense. They're starting to, you know, come into form a little bit. I know they just lost on the game. Definitely the score looked a lot closer than what it really was. It was just a lot yeah. of garbage time, just pass interferences. Carson Wentz just slinging the ball. But um, against the Giants, against Dallas, then they get a bye. If Miles Sanders isn't ready after the bye, they played the Giants again. So you get two games at least and maybe three very, very good matchups. I know Corey Clement is going to get sprinkled in, and I know this team isn't great, but they're going to be able to score against the Giants, and they're going to have to score against Dallas because that defense basically lets you score against them. We saw what Kenyon Drake did. So, um, honestly, it, it might make you look like an idiot if it doesn't work out, if dropping 100 bucks or however much fab you have on him left. But if you're a team that's, what, one and four, two and three at this point, um, I, I would just go for it. Yeah, I agree. And I think the first week people will go back to, like the first week without Miles Sanders and the Washington Redskins, he got hurt uh, too in that game. So so the snap count there wasn't fully represented. But even with that snap count, he was leading ahead of Corey Clement. So, And we've seen Boston Scott like produce uh, last year when he kind of – when Miles Sanders got hurt. So I don't think Boston Scott's a bad player. Uh, so I would actually take that shot. I don't know if I'm spending 100% of my fab unless I'm literally like, you know, 1-5 and five or whatever. I really need that win. Um, but I definitely would shell out a pretty penny to see see what we can get working, uh, to see if you can kind of squeeze a win out of him. Um, yeah, I just realized the hypothetical records I threw out didn't add up to six. Yeah, yeah two, three, I mean. one, and four. <laughs> yeah. I was just running with it. Um, yeah. But since this video is probably going to be titled Buy Low, guys, if you want to buy low on Carson Wentz somehow and redraft leagues, go for it because they've played the Rams, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, Baltimore, and Washington week one. Washington week one was fully healthy, and they tore them apart. Now they get the Giants, Dallas, the Giants, Cleveland, Seattle, Green Bay, New Orleans, Arizona, and Dallas all in a row. I know the New Orleans Saints definitely have a decent enough defense to make you worried, but it's going to be a game where they're going to have to throw. They're getting most of their valuable weapons back. I know we don't want to shit on a guy who just got hurt, but Zach Ertz just hasn't been good. They're getting Goddard back. They're getting Jalen Rager back. Hopefully Miles Sanders will be back after the bye. Travis Fulgham's coming to his own. Maybe Deshaun Jackson and Alshon Jeffrey want to play football this year. We'll see. If they do, he's getting his full slate of weapons. The offense line still sucks. But he's been a decent fantasy producer and fairly consistent despite the tough matchup. So it's only wheels up for him going forward. Yeah, I agree. 
And next game, I mean, we don't want to spend as much time on this freaking stink versus stink. We got Washington Red, Washington football team against the New York Giants. I'd say, you know, the one interesting thing is like Kyle Allen, similar to what he did in Carolina Panthers, he only locks on to one target. He does not know how to progress through any type of read. So that's good for Terry McLaurin. Saw 12 targets, seven receptions, 74 yards. Not good for his deep prowess because Kyle Allen is probably the worst deep ball passer in the entire NFL. Um, but it's good to see, you know, you have that volume locked in. So if you're worried about Terry McLaurin, you shouldn't be. It's going to be pretty similar, uh, maybe a slight downgrade because he's not as good as Dwayne Haskins, but he'll get the volume, which is what you want to see. I think the interesting thing, though, is like J.D. McKissick is getting a lot of work. So, uh, you know, he got eight carries for 41 yards, but more importantly, he got six targets and six catches. So he's kind of eating into Antonio Gibson's workload there, although Antonio Gibson also had like five targets uh, for four catches. So I'm not saying that you should, you know, bail on Antonio Gibson and get J.D. McKissick, but if you're desperate for a kind, kind of like a bye week fill-in flex play, J.D. McKissick is not a bad, not a bad fill-in um, given the game game script they're going to be facing. Yeah, J.D. McKissick just hurts Antonio Gibson more than he hurt than he helps himself. Like he's not really bringing too much value to himself. All he's doing is killing Antonio Gibson. Uh, you hit the nail on the head with Terry McLaurin. Like it's not a great situation. It wasn't a great situation with Haskins either, who's obviously a little bit better of a deep ball thrower. Uh, but we look at what Terry's got upcoming. He plays Dallas this upcoming week. You're not going to be able to get him after that. He plays the Giants again. I know he didn't have a great game. Maybe they try to move him into the slot a little bit more this week after the or the upcoming game after they saw what happened to him this week when he was on the outside. Then he gets Detroit, Cincinnati, and Dallas all in a row. Uh, if you can buy low right now, just do it because there aren't many players at this point that you can like basically pencil in double digit targets in like sixty to seventy yards every week as a floor. And honestly, I was thinking about it like for redraft, Mike, who would you rather have? Allen Robinson or Terry McLaurin? Or is it like a push? Because to me, they're just in very, very similar situations. Uh, I think I think I, it's probably a push to be honest, but I, maybe a slight edge to A Rob because I do think A Rob's still the better player, and you know Nick Foles is targeting him enough. But yeah, it's it's definitely very close. Yeah, I think you can easily just like if you have A Rob, get Terry plus because in my opinion, and I guess in Mike's as well, it's it's not too big of a difference. They're both playing with bad quarterbacks on not so great teams, but getting a ton of volume. And what I like out of Terry McLaurin too is he's not all too dependent on those deep throws. He's being used over the middle a lot. I believe he's like top five or top three in yards after catch for receiver. So he's definitely using his speed, uh, putting that on display in the Redskins or the Washington football team. I was trying to use him as a dynamic playmaker, and it's worked out pretty well so far despite tough matchups. But on yeah. the other side of the ball, Mike, how worried are you about Evan Ingram? Because it just seems like oh, this um, team does not know how to use him. Yeah, this team does not know how to use him. His, his average depth of target is insane. You know, maybe it has to do with his list coming back from this Frank injury. You can't really even start him anymore, uh, which is a damn shame because I actually had him in a, in a bunch of spots. Um, I mean, the whole team stinks. Obviously, the freaking Andrew Thomas, <laughs> huge bust, huge bust. I remember Snacks was like super pumped about Andrew Thomas, O line one. Uh, meanwhile, Tristan Wirfs is over there on the Bucks, just balling out of control. Uh, obviously, Giants could have had a shot at him too. So you hate to see it, <clears throat> but you also don't hate to see it because the Giants, nobody cares. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it, I'm definitely worried. Like, you, you, I think Evan Ingram is probably droppable in, in redraft formats and Dynasty. You want to hold on to him to see what happens. Uh, next year once maybe he's fully healthy and maybe once they've kind of had a full year under the under wraps of the new new regime and with Saquon Barkley back but yeah it's it's brutal all right who got up next you want to talk about Cincy and Indy that's gonna be another short one we don't have to talk too much I guess we can say like AJ Green actually looked decent it seems like they're trying to use him more for mm -hmm. like the short intermediate game because he definitely doesn't have the juice to go downfield anymore I honestly think he might be a trade target in real life I think that they're trying to put on display that he still has a little bit left in the tank I'm not sure how, like, the money works out with – I think he's franchised or whatever. But maybe a team like the Patriots wants to take a shot on him. Maybe a team like the Saints wants to take a shot on him. Somebody who's a contender because he did look decent out there. I'm sure if he's in a better situation with a quarterback that isn't getting smoked, like, two seconds after they snap the ball, I would be decent for him. And I just think that what T. Higgins has shown and the fact that Tyler Boyd is just a solidified weapon in this offense is that A.J. Green isn't a necessity, especially with his age and the fact that this team is rebuilding. I don't be surprised if he gets shipped off, but – Mike, your boy T. Higgins is legit. And that connection with Joe Burrow is yep. looking great despite all the issues going on in Cincy. I tried to tell you all, man. I tried to tell you all when you guys were disrespecting Hey, we haven't T. seen Higgins. Mims yet. We said Mims was the so better guys, version. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you guys kept trying to disrespect Teddy Higgins. But Teddy Higgins has been out there balling out of control. And I love the connection. Uh, I love the fact that he landed with where Burrow was because I wanted to see how they developed together. And he made that deep play. And you saw that like speed is definitely a limiting factor because he got caught from behind and he's not going to be a burner. But he, the way he attacks the ball while it's in the air and contests catches, he's going to be the wide receiver one going forward with Joe Burrow. And Joe Burrow trusts him. You can see that. So you love to see it. T. Higgins, 
shot way up my ranks. I would take T. Higgins over OBJ right now today. Um, he's kind of moved up into my top 12, 15-ish wide receivers. I don't know. Check the ranks. I updated it yesterday. Uh, but he's an absolute baller. I mean, T. Higgins is a baller. You know, we'll kind of like parlay that into – the other game, uh, unless you want to cover more on this, but I want to parlay that into Minnesota and Atlanta. Can we touch on Jonathan Taylor a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess my boy JT. I mean, he actually looked pretty good this game. Uh, he I still, still didn't think get he, like he struggles a little bit between the tackles. I actually watched a Nick Whalen video talking about how he runs <laughs> tackles, Mike. So I know you love that, but I like I honestly agree with what he said. Obviously, he knows a lot more about film than I do. I just watch the fucking game and see what happens. But Jonathan Taylor, to me, looks like when he's between the tackles, he's just not doing much. He looks fantastic out in space because he's 230 pounds and he's fast as hell but the problem is this offense is led by philip rivers and the fact that the the chances of him being used out in space consistently aren't very high but when he is used out of the backfield like very early in the game that catch the catch he had 20 yards another one 20 yards he's yep. he's shown to be a decent receiver he's shown to be good when running to the outside my only concern is the non like the lack of commitment that they've shown to him and them wanting to throw with Philip Rivers for some reason, even though it's basically an arm punt because he's going to turn it over. Or he's not going to complete the pass. And the other thing that kind of worried me is Trey Burton got a goal line carry on like a <laughs> option as a yeah. little Indy Indy instead of Philly Philly. He ran it in, which took away from Jonathan Taylor having a bigger game than what he was uh, in line to see. But um, I think coming off the buy and their upcoming schedule is going to hopefully uh, bode well for him. Maybe you want to buy low and redraft. Although I think the people that have had Jonathan Taylor and drafted him, um, and thought he was going to be what he is right now, aren't going to sell him after like eight weeks of hoping. Yeah, that's uh, it. Look, I, I do think he looked better this week than he had in prior weeks. I'm not saying he's like looks fantastic, but look, it's, it's a development issue. I, the, the thing that does give, give me comfort is that like vision was not an issue in college, right? So maybe it's like part of the learning curve. I'm not a freaking running back expert of like reading holes and stuff like that, but he did look excellent in space. He does look excellent as a receiver. Um, it's good to see, you know, he kind of get that, get that work on the outside and look, they're not going to be running. They're not gonna be running Trey Burton on the goal line every time. So I'm not as worried about that, uh, to be honest, but yeah, I do agree. The schedule coming up though, they get to face, they get to face Houston twice, which is just money because that is a run funnel defense. They get to face the Titans twice. Uh, they get to face the lions, the Raiders, the Packers, like just all run funnel defenses. So I think the schedule really opens up for him. So if you want to try and acquire him, I'm still all in on dynasty. I'm still glad we, Personally, I'm so glad we dropped him over CH, to be honest, in our BBB league on a PPC base, but basis. But I, I don't think you guys should be giving up on Jonathan Taylor. But speaking of rookies, man, the rookie that we want to talk about is the Minnesota Vikings against the Atlanta Falcons. Obviously, Minnesota got the brakes beaten off them because Kirk Cousin went out there and threw three fucking picks to, to kick it off. But that opened up the door for Justin Jefferson, who thankfully, thankfully, I went back and I went back to check just to make sure because I remembered it, but I went back to make sure. We had him ranked ahead of Jerry Judy. We had it, uh, T.D. Lamb, Jalen Rager, and Justin Jefferson. So we had Rager the... number one. I don't know who that idiot was. But <laughs> uh, look, Rager's, Rager can easily still play to that tag once he comes back. So we're not. I gonna... mean, every rookie receiver has blown up this far. He just hasn't had the opportunity to. So maybe he's just waiting to have the biggest blow up of them all. Yep. I mean, we talked about this before, but Justin Jefferson, I talked about on Market Watch Mondays. He is the he is the alpha dog there. He had 11 targets, nine receptions, 166 yards, two touchdowns. His efficiency as a rookie has been historic. So, what do you what do you think, man? Like, I I'm, I'm basically moved him back to back with Ceedee Lamb in my rankings. Like, who who do you prefer right now, Ceedee Lamb or Justin Jefferson? I would I would take Ceedee Lamb. I just think that the offense right now, like when Dak comes back, it's going to be more consistent. Like Justin Jefferson's been great. He's also had very, very good matchups for him to be great in. I think that's this is still in a team that has a run first identity. Obviously Dalvin Cook was out and Alexander Madison looked like an absolute bum out there. Bum, the defense, dude, just a bum. <laughs> like this is he had like I, a 20 yard run and he ended with like 23. It was like a very <laughs> light version of uh Leonard Fournette. No, I, I never run. understood the Alexander Madison hype. There's like people out there like, oh well, now you guys gonna get to see what like Alex Ma Alexander Madison looks like. Now you're gonna get to see why he's like a starter <laughs> and like why he's as good as Dalvin Cook. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. This guy stinks. This guy yeah, but, stinks. Um, Back to Lamb versus Jefferson. Yeah, I'm just in a slightly lean Lamb, but it's like, honestly, for rookie of the year voting, I know the quarterback's probably going to win it, but Justin Jefferson has definitely had a CD Lamb at this point. I know Dallas fans are going to rip my head off for it, but Justin Jefferson is basically what CD Lamb has been, but more blow up games. He's been great after the catch. He's playing on the outside, yep. which I know a lot of people thought he couldn't do despite him doing it prior to Jamar Chase cementing himself in that offense. So I'm not sure why there was a concern there, but he's just been so good after the catch, winning contested situations. As you said, he's extremely efficient. I think another good dichotomy to throw out there is Justin Jefferson versus A.J. Brown for Dynasty. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm still thinking AJ Brown uh, because we've seen him do it for longer. But look, I think the gap is a lot closer than people think. Like I talked about uh, the untouchable group, right? It's, it's really DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, um, CD Lamb, and, and Justin Jefferson. Like they're kind of like going to form that form that group. And if you can still get these guys, I would go out and do it. And, you know, I put out a video earlier in the year about buying high. These are like examples of where I think you can buy high and still profit because people are still going to be like, Hey, they're just rookies. You know, it's only five games and, and blah, blah, blah. But you know, for me personally, I've seen enough of their early on success coupled with their profile to kind of like basically push the chips in. Um, so like, I just, I actually added Justin Jefferson a couple of weeks ago uh, on one of my teams and I have him in the what to do dynasty uh, so good luck trying to trade him for me in that league, anyone. But yeah, I definitely think he, he's definitely climbing up there and you should be getting him for sure. Yeah, would you rather have him? I think I know the answer to this, him or DJ Moore. And I think that's actually like a realistic trade to make. You can probably move a DJ Moore for a Justin Jefferson. Yeah, yeah, I would rather have Justin Jefferson because Rob, we're going to talk about him later, but Robbie Anderson's a real deal. Um, so I love Robbie Anderson. Yeah, he's so fucking good. But And Adam Thielen had a bit of a down game, three catches for one touchdown, but... Dude, if you're in redraft, you still want him. And Kirk Cousins, garbage time king right now, uh, putting up numbers. So I wouldn't be too worried. On the Falcon side, I mean, a bit of a resurgence from Matt Ryan, lighting it up. You know, Calvin Ridley did his thing. You know, six catches, 61 yards, touchdowns. But more importantly, Julio Jones, welcome back to the fold. Uh, you know, everyone was scared about him, his injury. He came back and just balled the fuck out. You know, eight catches on 10 targets, 137 yards, and two touchdowns. So proven that he's still the alpha when healthy. Uh, but from a fantasy perspective, you obviously you still want Calvin Ridley going forward because they're they're both just really good receivers, man. Alabama, Alabama just produces, just produces guys. That's all they do. They produce. Yeah, I think guys. both sides of this game, like this, both these teams are just automatic garbage time. No matter who they're playing, it's just gonna be garbage time for them. It yep. just happened that they were playing each other, and both teams had very very good fantasy days. I actually saw a tweet that. Nick responded to some guy like tweeted at halftime. He's like, you told me to start fucking Justin Jefferson, you idiot. And Nick's like, this is why we watch all four quarters because Justin <laughs> Jefferson had like 170 yards and two touchdowns. But uh, as you were saying, like, I know there was like a few kind of garbage touchdowns where like Matt Ryan was about to run past the line of scrimmage. He did like a little moonwalk. Shout out to MJ. <laughs> Julio Jones, wide open, 40 yards down the field. Same thing with Hayden Hurst at the end of the game. It was just like a little dump off he took for 50 yards. But Matt Ryan just looks so, so, so much better when Julio Jones is out there. Oh His my offense God. as a whole just looks better. And Todd Gurley looks bad when he's out there. So I love this. I love when Julio's back in the fold because it makes us look good about uh, all of our preseason takes. Hayden Hurst, if you can sell high, I would. I just don't think that – I think what we said in the offseason was like – Sure, there's a lot of open opportunities and a lot of empty volume now in this offense for him to capitalize on, but you have to be a good player to capitalize on that volume. Yeah. We've seen through six weeks at this point that he's really not, he's not cemented himself as a viable weapon in this offense. Like Russell Gage is still being used. So I think if you can trade him, um, I don't know who you buy because all tight ends kind of stink. But if you have two tight ends and you have the luxury to trade one of them, I'd go for it and try to get a position type of player or positional yeah. player. Definitely. Uh, next game, you know, Nick, too bad Nick's not here, but Esau's boy, DeAndre Swift, finally break out, man. 14 carries, 116 yards, two touchdowns. He had that big run. I, I'm, I'm still personally pretty concerned as long as Matt, Matt Patricia is there uh, because you know damn well that he's going to march Adrian Peterson out there again. Adrian Peterson's hurt, obviously, but if it's not Adrian Peterson, it's Carrion Johnson. Like, DeAndre Swift still only played, like, below 40% of the snaps, I think. Now he, he got his highest rushing share in his high, uh, of the season. But, you know, it's really hard to keep up that type of – that, like, type of efficiency where you're basically rushing for, like, eight yards per carry and getting touchdowns everywhere. So, I'd be concerned um, for – It was good to dynasty. see that, like, off the bye, though, that they definitely tried to make him more of a focal point of the offense, even though Adrian Peterson was getting, like, a majority of the snaps and he started off the game. I think that it was – it's it's a good trend for him to start getting more work, him getting goal line carries, and him showing that he can break off big runs like that. Like, Adrian Peterson can still do that, but that's, like, all he brings to the table at this point. We obviously know DeAndre Swift can catch passes out of the backfield. Dynasty purposes, it's still a murky situation. I know Adrian Peterson is not going to be there long. I wouldn't be surprised if they spend like another second round pick on a running back next year and just make it another committee. So yeah. Um, yeah. I wouldn't get too, too high on him. But for redraft purposes, he's somebody that I'd be fine if he's going to be like your wide receiver or your running back three or four in a trade. Just taking the upside shot on him, trying to capitalize on somebody trying to sell high because he definitely has the talent to be an RB1 if they do want to commit to him. Yeah. Um, I think on the, I mean, Matthew Stafford 
kind of stinks, um, but they, they didn't really need him to do anything. So I think, you know, you can kind of still wait and see what happens. Is Kenny Galladay like the most unique receiver you've ever seen? He either has like eight catches for 50 yards and two touchdowns or like three catches for 115 yards and no <laughs> scores. Like I don't know any other receiver that has this type of splits. Yeah, he's he's good though, man. He He's balling. He's balling. Uh, but he, the TDs definitely have the strongest way. And that, that's one of the reasons why I was, I was like, I was really hesitant to invest in Kenny Galladay this offseason because everyone's like, oh, he's wide receiver one upside. I'm like, eh, does he though? He like already had double digit touchdowns last year. And they're like, oh, well, they're getting Matthew Stafford back, who was also very efficient with touchdowns last year. So you're kind of seeing that that regression comes back. But he's still a very good player. Um, well, he had two and, touchdowns before the bye. He's only played like three games. So I, I think yeah. he's fine. And that deep touchdown was obviously like a fantastic catch. And they want to use him down by the red zone still. So I think, I think for redraft, uh, he's still like a top probably seven or eight wide receiver for dynasty. He's a little bit older. He's like sneakily 27. So that's 35 around these parts. I think it's still high in him for a young guy like Justin Jefferson. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side, James Robinson had a quieter game, but he still did put four, four receptions and a touchdown through the air. Uh, so you like to see that he's still getting involved in the passing game. Um, their ground game, like, I mean, it wasn't much to be there because they got blown out and that's always a risk with the, with the bad team. I still really like James Robinson. Um, I think he's, he's proven to be one of the top rookie performers and I just don't see a reason why they would actually want to invest in the running back position going forward. So, um, you know, maybe this creates some nice buy opportunities for those of you contenders out there um, on James Robinson. Yeah, um, I would buy in Dynasty for redraft. Though. I, I am a little bit nervous just because, like, you can say, oh, they did get blown out. He didn't have the rushing opportunity. But they got blown out by Jacksonville. And there aren't going to be many games in the schedule where they're going to be yeah. close. yeah, against Detroit. They got blown out against Detroit. And there aren't many games in the schedule where it's going to be more favorable than a Detroit run defense. He did look like decent on the few opportunities he did have on the ground. I know it wasn't the most efficient day, but he did have a few nice runs. Uh, I'm just nervous because they're playing from behind. He has one goal line carry on the season, and that came back in, I believe, week three. Uh, the touchdown upside just isn't there because when they're in the red zone, they just want to throw um, two-minute drills. Chris Thompson decides to be out there. He does pick up a nice chunk of change in the receiving game. He averages like three, four catches a game. I just think that the upside for this season is, is really capped. And I actually made a trade in one of my home leagues uh, it's going to sound real dumb, but I traded him away for Mike Davis and Cooper Cup because I need wins now. And Mike Davis, I think this might be the next game we're talking about. Even if it's for one to two weeks, I think that's a nice buy low opportunity because people that are selling him know that Christian McCaffrey is coming back. But I think that they don't realize how good Mike Davis is despite that one down game. If you can get two to three more running back one top five performances out of a guy like that, go out and buy him for like a running back two or not a running back two, but like a wide receiver two if you need wins right now. Yeah, I mean, we're, we are going to move on to that game. Mike Davis, man, he has been so impressive. And he's one of the few bell, bell cows. He's not just a workhorse. He's a bell cow. He's playing like 90% plus of snaps. He's getting all the targets. He's getting all the carries. He's getting the goal line work. You just love to see it. Um, I mean, I actually grabbed him off waivers in some leagues just to just to cover for my CMC. Unfortunately, I didn't grab him as, in as many dynasty as I should have because he has been an absolute league winner in the games that he has played. Um, Not that old yeah. either. I think he's either 25 or 26, and he doesn't have that much wear on his tires. And every time he's played, even in Seattle, he looked like – I he wouldn't say good like Chris in Carson, but he's like 80% of Chris Carson. Yeah, he looked, I mean, he looked pretty good in Seattle, which is why I thought he would actually win the job outright from David Montgomery, and I still think he should have, but obviously that didn't happen. Um, DJ Moore, I mean, he had a great game. He had 11 targets. He was the target leader, 93 yards, uh, five catches. But Robbie Anderson, like, he's not going away, man. Like, this is the floor, like, game of Ferrari. He low-key has, like, the best hands in the league. I haven't seen this guy drop a pass. Actually, he did drop a touch on, like, two weeks ago. But those yeah. grabs that he had, he had one down the sideline where he dove for one, um, fully extended, absolutely awesome guy. Another one, he went deep down the field, caught it again. And I know DJ Moore out-targeted him. It was the first time he did it since week two. But despite seeing five less or six less targets than DJ Moore, he had one less catch and 16 less yards. He's yeah. he's a wide receiver one. I know it's him. easy to say. And after, yeah, after like all these weeks of production, you just have to like block out the name and look at the numbers. And it's basically like 90% of Julio Jones. Yeah. I moved him up uh, basically where Robert Woods is in my dynasty ranking. So like I moved him ahead of OBJ. It didn't feel good, but it felt great at the same time. I mean, it feels right. It just feels right. You got you to go with what feels right. Um, on the flip side of the ball, uh, DFS chalk play of the week was Dave Montgomery, and I faded that because you just – I mean, you just don't do it. I he mean, stinks. Dave Montgomery – so bad. He's a younger were like, David Oh, it's Johnson. a smash spot. Yeah. Against the league's worst rushing defense, Dave Montgomery went 19 carries for 58 yards, uh, 3.1 yards per carry, and he had a couple catches. Uh, you know, look, look, Dave Montgomery isn't bad, but, like, 
he's just like never a smash play. He's not going to be a ceiling play for you at, against any matchup. I mean, against the Atlanta Falcons, he put up like seven points, which is like my key indicator and like into why I didn't really care about playing him. Um, he's a fine RB2. He's not going to win any leaks, but he's not going to win any weeks. So don't get too excited. Allen Robinson continues to be the leader. Darnell Mooney, I'm just irrationally happy when he gets a catch, like an inconsequential catch of 10 yards. I'm like, fuck yeah, that's Darnell Mooney out there. Hopefully. This offense picks up a little bit, but Darnell Mooney's still a good stash, I think, in, in leagues. And he's basically, I mean, he's definitely played Anthony Miller into the dirt. Um, Darnell Mooney is the wide receiver, too, there. And you got him for free. So hang on to him, see what happens. Yeah, for sure. I think, are we going to move over to the Jets game? Like, yeah, I think we I don't can comf- spend much time <laughs> talking yeah, about We this can one. comfortably say, like, this Jets team of last week, at least, is like the worst team I've seen in my entire life. Like, they look like a D3 type of high school team. Like where you go yeah. out there and like just fans of the fans in the crowds are like the parents of the players. Like nobody wants to watch these guys play. Um, on the other side of things, Miami is now moving over to Tua Tagovailoa. He had like three throws last week and he kissed the field. So uh, it looks like he's healthy. I don't see any reason for them to put him out there if he's not healthy or yeah. if he's not like fully developed. And the one thing I worry about though is like he definitely has rushing upside that we saw during his time in Alabama. I would be kind of cautiously optimistic about his rushing upside in his rookie year, just because I'm sure that they're going to tell him to just like lay down if he's about to get sacked or not try to pick up those extra yards and take unnecessary hits. Um, I don't think this offense is going to be set back at all by him taking over. Maybe the week after the bye when they play the Rams, it's going to be a bit tough because they do have a really good pass rush and they have a few good cornerbacks out there. Um, but after that, they get a pretty nice schedule to play Arizona, which did look great against the, the Dallas Cowboys this past week, but they're not the Rams. Uh, the Chargers, Denver, the Jets, Cincinnati, Kansas City, uh, the Patriots are tough, and then the Raiders again. So it's not too tough a, of a slate. I'm still fine with the weapons that they had there. If you had Miles Gaskin, keep him. If you don't have him, go buy him because he is a legit workhorse, and he's getting fed the ball like I don't even know who. Like He's basically James Robinson at this point, except on a slightly better offense. Yeah, dude, in our BBB league, like me and Noah didn't even draft any running backs other than Jonathan Taylor, and we're in third place now because <laughs> I acquired James Robinson off waivers before we, before week one, and then I acquired Miles Gaskins off, off waivers. So we're just like balling out with these like waiver wire running backs. Oh, and Rojo, Rojo, the king. Um, but yeah, look, he I think he's a real deal. I'm actually going to acquire him in Dynasty again just because like people assume James Robinson's going to get replaced. People assume Miles Gaskins going to get replaced, but like, these two orgs have no reason to invest in the running back. Yeah, they paid like, Jordan Howard and they paid Matt Breida. Jordan Howard's been a healthy scr- scratch, and Matt Breida is comfortably the number two. They are not getting consistent usage. Looking back to week three, Miles Gaskin is averaging 20.8 touches a game, and he's the fifth most targets among all running backs to this yeah. point this season. So he's he's a legit workhorse. Yeah, and like everyone thought that Miami Dolphins were to invest in DeAndre Swift this year in the draft. What do they do? They're like, no, fuck that. We're going to invest in O-line quarterback positions that actually matter. Uh, seems like they have a smart, smart front office, smart coaching. So I think there's a chance that Miles, Gat- Miles Gaskin just like kind of retains this job going next year. I'm, am I expecting like RB1 numbers all the time or mid RB2 numbers all the time? No, but like if you can acquire him for a for a third round pick, which is what I did, or even like a second round pick, I think it's I think it's worth it for a contender, especially if you're if you're really contending, right? And even if you don't need him now. I'd be willing to make that move and pay that price to get him because I'd rather prepay for insurance than to pay out the ass once an injury happens and just be scrambling for running backs. That's kind of what I did with him. And I would encourage those of you guys out there to do the same. Um, the next game we want to cover green Bay versus Tampa Bay bucks. Uh, Aaron Rodgers went out there and uh, put up a, put up a dud, uh, put up negative 14 points. But yeah. Put up negative 14 points against uh, in Scott Fishbowl. And if you're playing in leagues with me where you have like negative minus, minus four for interceptions, he's scoring you negative points. And <laughs> it, was, it was not a pretty sight to behold. And it was clear that he kind of like got flustered. And then once, once everything started, it was, just, it was just bad. It was bad news bears for everyone. A.J. Dillon, people are out there taking victory laps because he like looked good on like five snaps. Um, I wouldn't he got like flipped really over. He's, I don't know, he's a fraud. You can't yeah, be flipped over when you're 250 good. pounds. Yeah, AJ Dillon's not that good. But look, I don't think Aaron Rodgers stinks. I wouldn't be too worried. The Tampa Bay Bucks just have a really good defense. They have the entire time. The only people that have really gone to town on them is the god Justin Herbert. Other than that, like, you know, it's been it's been pretty that was expected. pretty shut down over there. Yeah, that was expected by the God. And Tom Brady, not much to say there, but Ronald Jones, man, had himself a game, 23 carries, 113 yards, two touchdowns. And he had like a couple two targets for two receptions and eight yards. So typical Ronald Jones stat line when it comes to receptions, but he's the clear one two down grinder. And that's what we've been saying for a while. And I just don't see Ron, uh, 
you know, freaking Leonard Fournette actually outplaying him at this point because Ronald Jones has actually looked pretty damn good. Uh, Keyshawn Vaughn got in there a little bit, but, you know, not too interesting there from him. So Ronald Jones is the guy to own there. Hopefully he keeps balling out so that Noah and I can keep riding him to the promised land in the BBB league. Yeah, I think he's a locked in, like, top 10 play the rest of the season. I know it's crazy to say, but, like, when I look down the list of running backs, it's a toss-up for me between a guy like Ronald Jones and James Conner. I mean, he's getting the volume. And the way that this offense is set up, it's like if they're down by a lot, he's going to be he's gonna be scoring opportunities because they're going to be pushing the ball down the field. He's their goal line back. If they're up by a lot, they're going to be pounding the rock with him, as we saw this past week. And he has the juice to break a few long runs. I know the Green Bay Packers don't have the best run defense, and he didn't look great until, like, later on in the game. But, I don't know, he just has that type of upside where he can break a long one at any point of the game. Uh, he did well against Chicago. He's, I believe him and Derrick Henry are the only running backs this year to have three or more 100-yard rushing games. And looking at his upcoming schedule, he plays the Raiders this week, the Giants thereafter, the New Orleans Saints, which is a tough run defense. But as I said before, it's going to be a shootout. They're going to be scoring. He's going to be on the goal line. He's going to score a touchdown there. I guarantee it until he doesn't do it. Then I don't guarantee it. Then he plays the Carolina Panthers, the Rams, Kansas City Chiefs, Minnesota, Atlanta, and Detroit. And that's all in a row. They have a buy in week 13. So he's going to be a legit running back one for you, hopefully, for a long stretch. And then in the fantasy playoffs, he gets another good slate. So uh, I'm super high on him. And as you said, like Leonard Fournette had one big game, and it was against Carolina. And he had that huge run at the end of the game. Um, And Ronald Jones didn't look great in that one. But I believe he had like a touchdown as well. And even before that, like Leonard Fournette had a game with like five carries for five yards, seven carries for 15 yards. I just don't see with him being a healthy scratch these past few weeks. And um, the fact that they went out there and felt confident with just Keyshawn Vaughn and LaShawn McCoy behind him, I see no reason for them to keep pushing Ronald Jones as a workhorse, as a guy who can see 20 to 25 carries. I actually listened to like one of the post-game press conferences with Bruce Arians. He's like, I believe in Ronald Jones being a 20 to 25 plus touch guy. Obviously, that's coach speaking. Obviously, he's going to want to make him sound like he's a better running back than he is. But at this point, I don't think he's hyping him up enough because he's looking like a young Alvin Kamara out there without the receiving upside. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, so not well, Alvin Kamara at all, but I like yeah, to say. Basically not Alvin Kamara. Um, but yeah, the last game we'll cover on this late, San Francisco versus LA Rams. Jimmy G, revenge tour, went out, looked pretty damn good, and George Kittle reestablished himself as a tight end one dynasty, was balling out of control, seven for 109, and a tutty. Love to see it. Raheem Mostert, man, gone again. Uh, he came back. He's so good when he plays, too. It's yeah, such a shame he's so he can't good. stay healthy. Good night, sweet prince. But Jermichael Hasty, you know, he's definitely free. So if he's available on your waivers, definitely go take a shot at him. But I think more importantly, it's going to be run JMC again, man. We saw what he did without Raheem Mostert, and I think we're going to see much of the same. So, you know, obviously take a shot at Jermichael Hasty because he's free. But I think Jared McKinnon, uh, hopefully you guys still have him uh, from when we told you to pick him up. I think he's going to be a pretty solid play going forward. Um yeah, I think this side, game though. was just like a matchup of teams who you don't really want any of the weapons on either side of the ball because you don't <laughs> yeah. have to start other than George Kittle. Like the wide yeah. receivers in, on the Rams, like Cooper Cup is seeing a whole bunch of targets. He's on pace for 100 t- targets, 120 targets quietly this year. He's had over six every single week since week two and seven or more in each of his last four games. But the production is just like really on and off because this, yeah. game, this team is predicated on like short throws. And the few times that they do throw it deep down the field, which Cup saw two deep targets last game, it's just an overthrow. Like he could have yeah. easily had like 200 yards and three touchdowns this week, but Jared Goff is behind center and they're playing the, the 49ers. So it just didn't happen that way. Um, as for that backfield, rest Cam Akers, man, Akers. Jesus Christ. I cannot believe he did not get a single snap. I'm, I'm hoping. No, I, like Cam Akers of snaps. Me. I I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that he, uh, that he is still kind of hurt and they're trying to ease him back in. Darrell, dude, shout out to Darrell Henderson. You know, he's been playing pretty damn well and he looked pretty good out there uh, rushing the ball. So if you have Darrell Henderson, like I think it's going to be tough to start him because you still have Malcolm Brown in there for whatever, God knows whatever reason why he's still in there. But, you know, if Cam Akers kind of starts playing himself in a role, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, running back by committee roulette over there. It's something that you do not like to see. Um, it's definitely tricky. I mean, Sean McVay was looking like he had everything figured out early on in the season. Now is kind of looking more like, you know, 20, 2019 Sean McVay. You just, you just hate to see it. Yeah, if you do want anybody on this team, just do not buy him now. They play Chicago next week. Chicago's defense has looked really legit. If you want to buy in Cooper Cup because of those empty targets, go for it after that week. And I, I bought on Cooper Cup this week, so I'm, I'm a fraud for telling you advice that I'm not following, but He's, he's having decent usage, but then again, it's, it's the Rams, and you never know who to start in this offense. And Tyler Higby had a decent game, but a decent game for him is three catches for 50 yards. So, I mean, not yep. much to be excited about. 
All right, that's all we got for you this week in this week's film. Hopefully, you guys found it helpful. Ran through a shitload of games. Uh, these things are getting pretty high. If you enjoyed, as always, hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe, follow me, follow Noah, follow Nick on Twitter uh, at the handles, wherever they are. And, you know, I think we got more film coming out for you. We already, already had the Market Watch Mondays, obviously. I'll be doing a box break. I just got this thing uh, in the mail certified this box and then i got three of these uh origins boxes so i'll be breaking Who's that them on the in. front of them uh the god the one okay. true god that we all subscribe to justin herbert so i'll be breaking those down in a video and releasing that this week and i'll probably be incorporating some player analysis and value analysis in there just because uh you know that's kind of my specialty so i don't want to just open boxes and show you cards and so nick i'm sorry not nick uh, noah made me a super sweet thumbnail for that uh using my face so i'll be using that for the youtube video so i'll probably launch that you know some point this week or maybe on the weekend or something like that so be on the lookout for those videos as well lots of content lots of shit coming your way all day we're just grinding noah's grinding i'm grinding everyone's grinding uh so hopefully you guys find it helpful man shout out shout out to us shout out to nick for uh failing <laughs> on us i don't know we're the best week. uh ho- hopefully uh you know we'll be back next week and we'll get some more Get some more Godfather ticks on the spot. But, uh...